You've all seen this and we heard it from the previous speakers. What, what, what happened here? I mean, how are we going to explain this to our future colleagues? It started with the discovery of the PSA test in the late 80s, early 90s, the widespread dissemination, and then prostate cancer incidence rose. USPSGF then saying we have to stop PSA testing in 2012, and now we are down to the pre-PSA era level. And the conflicting trials that ERSPC and PLCO didn't make things better, it just caused confusion. The good thing about all of this is that the age-adjusted death rate from prostate cancer is down by 51% from peak rates, but we just heard that it's on the rise, and now it looks like it's flat, this curve is actually flattening out for the first time. So this is really worrisome, because we know that PSA testing reduces prostate cancer mortality. We know that from our European screening trial, and also the PLCO trial shows the same thing if you take into account the fact that a lot of men had PSA testing in the control arm. But there is this problem with the balance between benefits and harms. So there's a reduced risk of mortality metastases, but also the downsides, which is false positives and overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And the problem is that as currently practiced, this balance is, is very fine. Let me give you five examples of what we've been doing wrong over the past decades. We just heard that no primary care physician engages in shared decision making, which is a problem. There is excessive PSA testing in men who are unlikely to benefit, so we're more likely to screen the man to the right here in the picture than the man to the left. We have definitely had two liberal criteria for prostate biopsy, so we've been biopsying to the right and to the left. We know that the PSA has a tendency to fluctuate. We also know that biopsy comes with the risk of infectious complications and even hospitalization, so it's, it's not trivial to perform a biopsy when it's not indicated. We have certainly been over-treating low-risk disease. We have, over the past two decades, the rate of active surveillance has only been 10% for low-risk tumors. And when treatment has been provided, it's been largely by low-volume providers. Can anyone tell me uh, the typical radical prostatectomy caseload for a typical U.S. surgeon 15 years or so ago? 20? Five? The answer is three. And this is problematic because we know that whose hands perform the radical prostatectomy can have a significant impact on oncologic and functional outcomes. And we know that this concept of the learning curve, so you have to know a certain number, done a certain number of cases before you master the procedure well. But PSA is a good test, so should we really be throwing it up with the bathwater like the USPSDF says we should in 2012? What's happened is that PSA testing rates have gone down in all age groups. The incidence we saw that has gone down in all races and also in all ages. So this is problematic. So men who might stand to benefit from the PSA testing are no longer given the opportunity. We've also known that, that the incidence of, of high-risk tumors or higher-grade tumors have increased. We've all seen these cases come into our clinics. But the good thing is we now have extensive knowledge on how to improve the balance between the benefits and harms of PSA testing. So we call it, it ain't what you do, but it's, it's the way you do it. So we designed these five golden rules to address the five problems that I just presented. The first thing is to get consent and engage in shared decision making. Somehow don't screen a man who doesn't want to have his PSA measured. Start these conversations at age 45 to 49 at baseline, I'll come back to that. And then what you do is that you risk stratify the rescreening interval according to the man's age, his general health, and the prior PSA level, meaning you can screen more frequently if the PSA is elevated or less frequently if it's below one, for example. Don't screen men who want benefits. Very easy, limit screening in older men, stop at 70 for most, and those men who are at age 60 or over with a PSA less than one. I'll come back to that too. Don't biopsy unless you have a compelling reason. Repeat the PSA workup for benign disease, as we know that BPH is the most common cause of a PSA elevation, and consider additional markers that can improve the specificity of the PSA test. Recommend active surveillance for low-risk prostate cancer. I'll talk more about that in my next talk. And then if you do have to treat, refer men who need treatment to a high-volume provider. The reason we say start at age 45 comes from these studies from Sweden 
sort of in the natural history study, this is the Malmö Preventive Project, where we showed that 44% of deaths by age, age 75, so long-term follow-up, actually occurred in men who were in the top 10% of PSA at baseline, so at age 45, which was 1.6 at the time. So baseline PSA is actually a stronger risk factor for prostate cancer mortality than both family history and race taken together. And it's also a, a large part of the population that can be stratified according to the baseline PSA as opposed to, for example, genetic risk. In Göteborg, in this, the screening trial that I was part of in Sweden, we started at age 50 as opposed to 55 that the AUA recommends, for example, showing that the reduction in mortality could be as high as 71% at 17 years compared to no screening. So the benefit is greater if you start screening sooner. We don't screen older men because of the problem with overdiagnosis. Dr. Crawford says we don't want to find these tumors in the first place. And stopping at age 70 is one way of having the number of, of overdiagnosed cases. Why do we say stop at age 60 if the PSA is less than one? Well, this is again from the Malmö Preventive Project showing that the long-term risk of dying from prostate cancer if your PSA is less than one is 0.2%. So it's really a super small risk, which means that these men can be exempted from further testing. And instead, we should focus on men who are at increased risk based on the PSA level. If that's 1.5 or 2, can, can be discussed. But in this study, where we compared men in Göteborg to unscreened men in Malmö, we showed that there was really a benefit in terms of mortality reduction of continuing to screen men who had an elevated PSA above 2, but continuing to screen men who had a PSA below 2, which was 75% of the population, only led to a risk of overdiagnosis without any benefit in mortality. Use of PSA isoforms, such as the free, free PSA PHI or 4K score, can reduce unnecessary biopsies by about 50%. What's interesting about the 4K score is also that the endpoint is not only the risk of high-grade disease at biopsy, but also long-term risk of developing metastases. So if you have an elevated PSA of 3, but your 4K score is low, less than 7.5%, your long-term risk of metastases is low, which means that these men can safely be exempted from biopsy and can be followed with, with continued screening and re-evaluation further on. So in solution, I think the answer to Dr. Whitmore's dilemma, is cure possible when necessary, and is cure necessary when possible, has been solved by Dr. Scardino, the former chairman of the Department of Surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering, who says that the answer is risk stratification, the right operation for the right cancer in the right patient at the right time. So the way to, to do this is to risk stratify screening and biopsy by improving the specificity of the PSA test. And then for those who don't need treatment, we, we do active surveillance. And when we do need treatment, we have a multimodal approach to, to treatment, which we will talk about at this conference. So cure is definitely possible uh, when, when it's it's necessary. Thank you.